HUD's 2020 Summer Webinar Series. My name is Clay Lloyd, and I'm a specialist in the Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division. Uh, this summer webinar series has been a way to do trainings for CDBG DR and CDBG mid grantees in lieu of our canceled 2020 problem solving clinic. And in that vein, I just want to invite everyone that's uh, listening to this webinar to uh, take part in the two upcoming webinars that are remaining in the series. Uh, you can find those at the HUD Exchange website. All right, next slide. Great, so the agenda for this uh, webinar is uh, infrastructure projects. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have an overview of the infrastructure project life cycle. And we're gonna go in a little bit into defining and setting up the project and the initial compliance and then move on to construction management and ongoing compliance. compliance. And finally, to uh, talk a little bit about closeout. And uh, I do just want to remind everyone, if you have questions, definitely use the chat box. Um, we have the people at ICF and people at HUD that are here to answer your questions if you have any. So just make sure to type them in the chat box uh, throughout the presentation. And uh, by means of introductions, uh, on this presentation, we have myself, Clay Lloyd, at HUD. We have Lauren Nichols at ICF and Robbie Bizzo at ICF. And uh, Robbie and Lauren uh, have uh, infrastructure experience, uh, so they can help us go through this presentation um, and give you valuable uh, training. Next slide. Great, so with that, I'll pass it off to Lauren. Thank you, Cla uh, thank you, Clay, and welcome, everybody. I just want to double check that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. All right, thanks, Clay. Um, again, welcome, everybody. Happy Thursday. Um, so today we're going to be going in, uh, into some of the main steps that grantees and subrecipients may experience and should consider as they design, select, set up, implement, and close out their infrastructure projects. One thing we aren't going to be diving into today in great detail is the architectural and engineering that's involved of designing infrastructure programs, and there are going to be a lot of compliance areas that we're going to touch on, but without going into great detail. Um, and then there are some compliance areas that we're actually not gonna really touch on today. However, uh, there are a lot of great tools on the HUD Exchange that go into each of these compliance areas, and please be sure to reference those, those tools on the HUD Exchange if you're wanting additional guidance or insights into those parts of the presentation. So one of the main learning objectives today is to provide a high-level overview and some examples of how many of these important compliance and logistics pieces fit together in the context of a CDBG DR or CDBG MIT funded infrastructure project. So this slide shows again, it's a fairly high level overview of an infrastructure project life cycle. Um, in this example, the sort of catalyst for making funding available is a notice of funding availability or a NOFA. And so the state or local government often will release a NOFA that details all the eligibility requirements, the scoring criteria, the timeline and approach for selecting and approving projects, and all the other details that applicants need to know in order to submit a complete and compliant application for funding. Once that NOFA has been released, then either, you know, usually whether it's a local government, another state agency, a nonprofit, or another subrecipient, will select a project and submit an application for funding. From, from there, typically the grantee will perform a subrecipient capacity assessment to determine whether the subrecipient has the capacity to carry out the proposed activity and any additional measures or technical assistance that, uh, that the grantee needs to provide to the subrecipient in order to get them prepared to be able to implement that project if it's needed. Uh, following this, you know, this application, then there will be a project selection and project approval. 
um, after they've demonstrated all the requirements um, have been met. And then once the project's been approved, typically it'll move to procuring or selecting services for, for developing the architect and engineering scope of work and specs for the project. From there, uh, the environmental review can happen once the project scope of work is defined. Then this is a critical step that must happen before moving to construction or obligating any funds. And once the environmental review is done, then the, the subrecipient or the grantee, depending on who is implementing the project, will typically move to construction procurement, which will help them get the best price for the work that they need. Um, and then move into con construction contracting, permitting from there, pre-construction conference before the project gets underway, followed by a formal notice to proceed, uh, then construction management and project completion all leading to closeout. So we're going to go into, into all this information in a little bit more detail. This is one, one way that, uh, you know, some of these pieces can perhaps occur in different order depending on how the grantee has their design set up, but this is a common structure for, for a project life cycle. All right, so I've thrown out a couple terms already, um, and just to take a step back there, so HUD grantee, grant, the HUD grantee typically is the entity and lead agency that receives the CDBGDR or CDBG MIT grant from HUD, and they ultimately are responsible for the oversight of those funds. The grantee can be a state, territory, tribe, or entitlement community, um, but they are the, the ones who are ultimately responsible to HUD. And then the subrecipient, there are a couple definitions, as you can see here in the regulations for a subrecipient. Um, but there again, it can be a local government, a nonprofit, council of government, another state agency, or other non-federal entity who has legal authority to administer a project or program on behalf of the grantee. And as you saw in, uh, in the life cycle here, you can see there is a there's a blue bar running throughout the entire life cycle of monitoring and record keeping. So it's important to understand that monitoring will take place throughout the life of the project. And it's performed by various entities, whether it's HUD, HUD OIG at the federal level, um, and the grantee at the state or local government at, or at the state or entitlement community level, and then the subrecipient will also have monitoring responsibilities. And in order to help facilitate that monitoring process, uh, there are record keeping responsibilities throughout the project. So record keeping is compiling and organizing all documentation and information in a way that tells the story to any reviewer for years to come. So for example, CDBG MIT has the potential to be a 12-year grant for a lot of these projects or you know the program. And what you're doing now to set projects that may review may be reviewed by teams, may be reviewed by teams of people with years down the road. And they should be able to pick up a file at any point and understand how and why projects are being approved, denied, or how they're meeting each step of the compliance requirement. So it's record keeping, it's not only just aggregating documentation, but making sure that it tells the complete and full story for, um, for folks to review down the road. And another key role and responsibility in this process that kind of runs throughout the life cycle of a project is technical assistance and clear communication. This goes, you know, not only for HUD provides technical assistance to their grantees, grantees provide technical assistance to their subrecipients, and clear communication should be occurring at all levels um, and across agencies. And Again, we'll be talking mainly today about grantees and subrecipients, and, and one of the most important messages through all of this is that they are partners with joint responsibility for success. And, and that includes making sure that expectations are clear, that all files are clear, and that um, all information is shared back and forth. Um, 
predictably and understandably so that they can help each other be successful in undertaking these very important projects. So as is common in all good project management plans, investing front end time and thoughtful planning into the design of a project is critical for the project success. So in this section, we're going to be talking about these first three components of the project life cycle, selecting and submitting the application, the subrecipient capacity assessment, and then project approval. So the first thing is in order to move forward with the project is you need to make sure that it's eligible. And there, there are quite a few sources of requirements and regulations that inform whether or not a project will be eligible under the program. And um, so we included this diagram to highlight the bodies of rules and regulation that go into the program design, and then ultimately the details of the notice of funding availability and the, pro and the program policies and procedures all of which ultimately set the parameters for the projects that subrecipients or grantees can put forward in their applications for CDBG, DR, or MIT funding. Um, it is worth noting that these sources of funds are some of the more flexible funding sources, uh, but different grantees or subrecipients may, may also choose to include additional restrictions that must be carried down to each project that, that is funded under each of the approved programs. So, the federal requirements set parameters, then the grantee sets additional parameters and definitions within their action plan, and they provide additional detail within their policies and procedures and into their NOFA, and then ultimately the subrecipients may also choose to put additional parameters um, within their policies and procedures. And ultimately the projects that are approved and implemented need to comply with all of those levels of eligibility. So when subrecipients or grantees are pulling together their projects that they want to approve, there are a lot of considerations. And often uh, within the application templates, grantees will include questions like this with, with more kind of specific parameters on how they have to be answered. Um, to get at, at this type of information. So some of the more important, these are just some of the, the questions that may come up, but you can understand, um, you know, like what is the project and how does it tie to the recovery from the disaster or meet a mitigation need? What are the quantifiable outcomes from the project? Who will benefit? Why should this project be prioritized over others? What's the timeline? What is the budget? Are all funding sources committed? Are there other untapped funding sources available for this project? Is it feasible, sustainable, and how are the long-term operations and maintenance going to be paid for? And again, does it meet all of the program criteria? And the idea here with all these questions, however they are framed in an application, is to make sure that the project is eligible, feasible, impactful, and implementable. All the answers to these questions should be clearly documented in the application for funding as it provides a transparent and justifiable explanation for why grantees and subrecipients are investing limited federal funding into specific investments. Um, and behind all of this, which I'm sure you've all read through different, uh, the Federal Register for both CDBG MIT and CDBG DR, is that coordination is key. In order to be able to answer all these questions, it's likely that the grantees and subrecipients will need to coordinate with other agencies, existing recovery or mitigation plans, and community stakeholders to help make sure all funding sources, investments, and efforts are maximized and leveraged wherever possible. Uh, like I said, this is specifically called out as a requirement and emphasized for both MIT and DR funded programs and projects, and it's foundational for implementing lasting and impactful projects. So this table outlines at a high level the fundamental requirements that all CDBG DR and MIT projects have to meet in order to be eligible for funding. Um, 
You can see there is a distinction here at the top between DR and MIT. So for DR, the activity must respond to a disaster-related impact identified in the grantee's unmet needs assessment. And then for MIT, uh, those projects have to meet the definition of a mitigation activity and address the risks identified in the mitigation needs assessment. Um, otherwise, for both funding sources, they have to be allowable in the appropriation and other laws, including in the federal registers. Um, and associated laws. They have to be eligible for the CDBG regulations or as a waiver alternative requirement. Um, they have to meet a CDBG national objective. They have to be eligible per the grantees action plan and their program policies and procedures and any other additional policies and procedures if a subrecipient has you know, additional policies and procedures. And then they also have to meet additional criteria for covered projects if applicable. Covered projects, there. this is a concept that is um, included in the CDBG MIT Federal Register. Um, it has been included in certain CDBG DR allocations as well. So here again, it's always important, depending on the source of your funding, to understand what additional criteria are, but this covered projects is a good example. Um, so, um, so grantee, so for in the context of MIT, for example, a covered project is a project with a total cost of $100 million or more with at least $50 million of CDBG funds, and that can be CDBG DR, MIT, or regular CDBG um, in that project. And so there are additional criteria for the covered projects if, if, if it meets those criteria, including demonstrating consistency with other mitigation activities in the same most impacted and distressed area, uh, demonstrated long-term efficacy and sustainability of the project, including its operations and maintenance, and the demonstration that the benefits of the covered project outweigh the cost, so through, a method described, through the methods that are described in the Federal Register. So these next slides really are kind of going into a little bit more detail about what was included in that table. But um, you know, as Congress appropriates CDBGDR and CDBG MIT funds for specific purposes, and in HUD, grantees and subrecipients have the responsibility to make sure all those appropriated funds are used for those purposes. So for CDBGDR funds, they must be used for necessary expenses related to disaster relief, long-term recovery, and restoration of infrastructure housing and economic revitalization. And then CDBG MIT activities are distinct and different from DR in and, and that they have to increase resilience to disasters and reduce or eliminate the long-term risk of loss of life, injury, damage to, and loss of property, and suffering and hardship by lessening the impact of future disasters. Um, so within the context of CDBG DR, it's the unmet needs assessment within the action plan that really outlines the recovery needs that a grantee is facing. And then in the context of CDBG MIT, it's the mitigation needs assessment that really outlines those risks and, and the unmet means for addressing those risks. Um, so sort of embedded, with, embedded within these concepts are these additional parameters around, around using funds and maximizing and coordinating funds. And one of the first, um, first foundational ideas here is this concept of order of assistance. So, Although the language may vary among appropriations, like a lot of these concepts do, um, the most common statutory order of assistance requirements prohibit the use of CDBGDR or CDBG MIT funds for activities that are reimbursable by or for which funds are made available by FEMA or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So what does this mean? It means that before you use CDBGDR or MIT funds, you should check to see if other funding sources are available or have been made available for that project. And this is particularly applicable to FEMA and core funding. Um, but this concept is also applicable, you know, 
conceptually to state and local funding. So you cannot use CDBG funds to supplant other funding sources that have been made available for the project or activity at hand. Um, then the next one is duplication of benefits, which um, which is which all grantees and subrecipients must comply with. So they have to comply with Section 312 of the Stafford Act and all applicable DOB notices and the requirement that all costs are necessary and reasonable and ensure that each activity provides assistance to an entity only to the extent that the entity has a recovery or mitigation need that has not yet been fully met. And again, what does this mean? It means that a subrecipient or an applicant cannot receive assistance from multiple sources for the same purpose and the, to and the total amount of assistance provided cannot be greater than the need. So for example, if FEMA has obligated 75,000 to a project, and the total project cost is 100,000, then the total CDBG DR or MIT funding that could be obligated to the project is $25,000 or less. So in other words, the amount from FEMA and the amount from HUD when they're combined cannot be greater than the amount of the project cost or else there'd be a duplication of benefit. And the basic principle with both of these rules is that we need to make sure we're being responsible with taxpayer dollars and, um, and also help make sure that we're maximizing all available funding sources. So another, um, an, another el one of the eligible activities within CDBGDR and MIT rules that CDBGDR and MIT funds can be used to meet a matching requirement, um, share or contribution with any other federal program when it's used to carry out another eligible CDBG, DR, or MID activity. There are some parameters around this. There, for example, one of the one of the ones that folks may be facing increasingly now as you're looking at your MIT programs is that there's a limit of using CDBG funds for a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project, it cannot, you cannot put more than $250,000 of CDBG funds into that project as match. Um, and then importantly, all match in and of itself or the non-federal cost share in and of itself is not an eligible activity. The project also has to meet all the applicable CDBG DR or CDBG MIT requirements in order to be used as the non-federal cost share. <clears throat> and so one tip for that um, is to ensure that all CDBG DR or MIT and applicable programmatic state or federal cross-cutting requirements are included in the design project worksheet, application, file structure, whatever it is, all of the all of the bureaucratic components of a FEMA or an Army Corps of Engineer project up front um, in order to build that into the design of that project early on. So there, there will be more guidance from HUD on cost share requirements, particularly for FEMA and CDBG. Um, but again, just understanding whether or not CDBG funds could be infused into a project can help you set that project up for, uh, for, for meeting all the CDBG requirements early on and save time on the back end. So we talk about infrastructure and infrastructure just defined as infrastructure isn't a category of eligible activity within the CDBG DR MIT rules, but so norm, there are these other concepts of, of eligible activity within CDBG, and the one that is most common is public facilities and improvements. Um, and so this often, so this includes generally publicly owned facilities improvements such as streets, playgrounds, underground utilities, and buildings. They can also be owned by nonprofits if they're open to the general public. Um, another way, though, that you can have an impact on, on public infrastructure is through these other activities, whether it's acquisitions and buyouts, public services, code enforcement planning, um, even some economic development activities. 
but just as an example, buyouts can be used not only as a proactive measure for protecting high-risk residents and helping them move to lower-risk locations, but they can also be used to, it, once folks are relocated out of harm's way, that land may be converted to a buffer zone or um, to be used as strategic stormwater or floodplain management uh, for surrounding areas, for the remaining surrounding areas. Um, often can be used as a good example of green infrastructure. Public services are allowable if they're being, if if the service is uh, for a new or expanded service, and some examples maybe in the context of infrastructure, maybe public safety services um, or recreation programs, energy conservation and counseling, um, and those types of services, all of which have a public benefit um, in that if the service is new or expanded. Code enforcement is its own eligible activity under CDBG, allows for the payment of salaries and overhead costs directly related to the enforcement of state and local codes. So for state and entitlement or local communities who are looking to change codes as part of their overall resilient recovery or mitigation strategies, or who need to ensure that rebuilding communities comply with the codes in order to protect, coordinate, and plan for the capacity needed for public infrastructure, such as stormwater systems or wastewater treatment facilities, they may decide to fund eligible code enforcement activities. And then planning, again, is, an, is its own activity within CDBG eligible activities, and it's often a key component for how communities assess their needs and risks from multiple perspectives, how they coordinate across funding sources and initiatives, and often can be used um, at, as the process, the public process for prioritizing specific infrastructure projects and initiatives. All right, the national objectives. Um, so this chart has all the national objectives that have been included in the various CDBG DR federal registers over the years. This is just to kind of highlight that this is just for CDBG DR. And again, it's important to understand, um, you know, each allocation may have different rules or parameters around this. Um, but generally, these are, these are all the national objectives that have been included over the years. Um, so there are quite a few ways to meet a national objective with CDBG DR funds. Um, and again, there are a lot of resources on the HUD exchange on how to meet a national objective. Um, but so generally grantees, so the first one being low to moderate income benefit, generally grantees are required to ensure that at least 70% of their funds will primarily benefit LMI persons. This may vary, again, from appropriation to appropriation. Um, and for MIT, it's been reduced to 50%. But it is important to remember that a core goal of CDBG funding is to benefit LMI persons. So grantees and subrecipients should clearly understand who the beneficiaries, whether they're direct or indirect, are for a project in order to understand if that project meets one of the LMI national objectives. So this first one, area benefit, um, for infrastructure projects, that, that tends to be one of the more common low to moderate income. Uh, national objectives that is used, and um, that's true under CDBGDR and regular CDBG. So Robbie's actually going to go through a couple examples here in a moment um, through LMA to show you how that one might be applied. The limited clientele project example could include improvements and in hardening to a homeless shelter that was damaged in a disaster, as that project would serve a presumed LMI population of, of homeless folks. For housing, um, housing isn't really used in the context of infrastructure programs very often, LM housing, but this national objective can be used for single-family homeowner rental programs, multifamily rental homeowner assistance programs when the applicants or the tenants are LMI. Um, the LMI jobs national objective could could be used in the context of an infrastructure project. For example, if the local government decides to undertake a street and stormwater improvement project, 
that benefits businesses on a commercial corridor who all commit to expanding their permanent full-time jobs in exchange for the improvements, provided those jobs meet the LMJ uh, criteria. And then, again, over the years, HUD has added two additional LMI national objectives to CDBGDR allocations, and those are LM buyout and LM housing incentives which has provided grantees additional flexibility in meeting their recovery and mitigation goals. They apply to the households who receive assistance to sell and re relocate their high-risk homes if, that, if those households are low to moderate income. So then moving from low to moderate income to slum and blight, um, these are, so slum and blight, or sorry, activities that meet a slum and blight national objective are activities that aid in the prevention or elimination of slums or blight in a designated area. And there's the area basis or spot basis. Area basis ends up being an area that is designated as slum and blight, and spot is um, pretty much what it describes, where it's sort of a single isolated project that's not included within a designated slum or blight area. Um, so, for example, in the context of an infrastructure project, this may mean, you know, or a, a subrecipient may decide to use CDBGDR funds to acquire and demolish a destroyed facility and then uh, convert that area to a public park or to another activity that eliminates the public safety and blight condition. And then the third area of national objectives is urgent or activities that meet an urgent need. And in the context of CDBGDR, HUD has granted alternative requirements from the standard CDBG certification requirements for documenting urgent need. But there are still requirements that grantees and subrecipients have to document and show in order to qualify a project under urgent need. So again, kind of going back to this concept that everything ties together and going back to the action plan, there has to be clear documentation um, for a foundational tieback that is often described in the grant, that will be described in the grantee's unmet needs assessment of their action plan. And so they'll describe, in the action plan, they'll describe the disaster impact that will be carried into the program policies and procedures of how an applicant has to demonstrate disaster tieback and then that'll carry down into the project file for how that particular project ties back to a recovery need from the disaster. So for CDBD MIT, the national objectives are very similar um, as we just went through for the CDBG DR <coughs> national objectives. But it is important to read the Federal Register and understand how they may be different from, from previous CDBG DR allocations and Federal Registers. And like I mentioned, um, for this appropriation of CDBG MIT, the LMI overall expenditure has been reduced from 70% to 50%. Um, so for CDBG MIT, HUD has created an, an urgent need mitigation national objective, which is a new national objective. And it has, it also has alternative requirements from the traditional CDBG urgent need national objective. So activities that are funded under this national objective have to address one or more of the current and future risks in the grantees mitigation needs assessment and in one of the HUD designated most impacted and distressed areas or the states or grantees designated most impacted and distressed areas. These activities also have to result in measurable and verifiable reduction in the risk of loss of life and property from future disasters and yield community benefits. And then, like I mentioned before, with covered projects, there's additional, um, there are additional requirements also if a covered project is going to be funded. Um, you have to demonstrate consistency with other mitigation activities in the same mid area or the most impact and distressed area, demonstrate long-term efficacy and sustainability of the project, including for its operations and maintenance, and then also demonstrate that the benefits of the covered project outweigh the costs 
through the methods that are described in the Federal Register. Um, one important thing that you'll notice from this chart is the omission of slum and blight. So in the Federal Register for CDBGMIT, HUD has included a waiver and alternative requirement that grantees shall not rely on the national objective criteria for the elimination of slum and blight conditions without approval from HUD. And the idea is that this national objective generally is not appropriate in the context of mitigation activities. So, there, you know, between the LM national objectives and the urgent need mitigation, those national objectives are more appropriate for, for the types of activities that are going to be funded with MIT funds. And with that, I am going to hand it off to Robbie Bizot to give us a little more detail about LMA national objective and the rest of the life cycle. All right, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, everybody. So as Lauren mentioned, the objectives that can be used under an infrastructure project, and primarily the most uh, commonly used is the LMA um, uh, National Objective, also known as Low to Moderate Area Benefit. Uh, as defined by 24 CFR 570-483-A1, Critical steps for determining what you'll see there is a chart, and you're going to be hitting some basic points in evaluating whether or not your project would meet the LMA national objective. That's through looking at the eligible activity itself, the service area, and asking whether that there are requirements and documentation that would want to be remained on file along with the project so for further uh, HUD audits or jurisdictional audits that are reasonable uh, association with national objective. An area benefit activity is an activity which will benefit all residents of an area, which is primarily residential. To meet the national objective of this benefit, uh, the LMI persons on an area basis, an activity must meet the identified needs of the LMI income persons residing in an area where at least 51% of the residents qualify as LMI individuals. There is an exception to this rule uh, in the event you have an upper quartile, maybe some type of exception criteria for entitlement communities, uh, which would also um, be, need, be, need to be considered when associating this LMI, LMA uh, national objective. If a grantee is able to document and support that a service area coincides with one or more census boundaries, the grantee may use the HUD-provided LMI survey uh, summary data, which is also called the LMISD or particular census tracts to determine whether the project will primarily benefit low and moderate income individuals. If the service area does not coincide with a census boundary, or if the service area includes parts of multiple census tracts, the grantee may perform a survey of the service area. Additional information on how to perform a survey on the new projects can be found at this link within this PowerPoint presentation. Let's look at a couple examples. So in the example you see here, a subrecipient is proposing to perform a street rehabilitation improvement within Census Tract 7720.01 Block Group 3. And what we've done here is we've given you an aerial photo using Google Maps. Uh, why is that important? Well, we want to know the footprints of the actual structures within this particular block group. Uh, and when looking at this picture, you'll notice uh, because Google Maps indicates um, actual commercial buildings or um, storefronts, it is primarily residential, um, noticing that just along that main thoroughfare along 25th Avenue North uh, is where the majority of the commercial or uh, storefronts reside. But primarily the rest of this block group is in fact residential, and you also see that they have a park to the left. Uh, you'll notice in red also, this is where the actual street improvements are going to be occurring. What you don't see in this picture is the fact that to the north of this neighborhood is the Gulf Coast. And knowing that we're treating this as a disaster recovery improvements project, in order for these individuals that live within this block group to have point of egress during evacuation times to move south from the north portion of the Gulf, individuals residing in this block group, which we'll call almost a large neighborhood, would access these roads in the event of future evacuations. So let's see how this project coincides with that table that we looked at before. 
So in this table, you'd recognize the same chart. We're looking at the eligible activity, service area, LMI percentage, beneficiaries, and is it primarily the residential? Well, looking into more detail of this eligible activity, the project scope in and of itself, this subrecipient is going to be doing 2,600 linear feet of street rehabilitation improvements. And we have to ask ourselves, does that fall under an eligible activity? In this scenario, it does. It falls under the eligible activity construction reconstruction of streets. So having that on, on file, document, and how you arrived at that would be necessary to validate and document that, that, that level of understanding. We also look at the service area. We realized that we were working within a census tract and then filtered down into with an individual block group in that census tract. The documentation that we're going to be used to support that service area is the map that we use to create the block group and actual rehabilitation of the streets within that map. We also look at the LMISD data uh, accessed on the HUD website. Uh, it is a spreadsheet which you're able to filter on the actual block groups uh, and census tracts you're looking for. And in this analysis, within this block group and census tract, 1,115 beneficiaries reside in which 655 are LMI. So dividing those over each other arrives at 58.74% LMI. So this is an LMI block group. Next, we look at the beneficiaries. Will all the beneficiaries have access to these improvements? Well, the street improvements are going to incur on main thoroughfares within the block group available to all beneficiaries, as we indicated, being that these are areas of evacuation route south in the event of a future storm. So the map created also supports that, documenting the egress and through some narrative of thoroughfares would also be adequate to support that, that documentation. And then lastly, are, is it primarily residential? You know, upon visual um, view of that map using Google, we did, um, we're able to accommodate the understanding that it is primarily residential. So you'll notice that we were able to answer yes for all of these questions. So therefore this block group and these improvements within this reconstruction uh, and construction of streets would qualify as an LMA activity. Let's look at another example. In this example, the subrecipient is proposing to perform sanitary sewer improvements at four different locations. And you'll notice within this map, we've outlined the actual specific project areas. Uh, you'll see they're west to east uh, within this city. Uh, the work includes rehabilitation of sewer lines within right-of-way access behind the properties and includes rehabilitation of the tie-ins to the residents' existing sewer lines. So what we wanted to make note here is that we understand that we're going to be doing rehab behind the individual's houses along a, basically a service alley. We're also going to be tying back into their, their, uh, their main lines to be able to access into their homes. But we also noticed that it's only a specific project area within this citywide area. So what would have made this something different? Maybe we could have treated this as an LMA. Well, let's look at that, that, that checklist to make sure. So we ask ourselves the same questions, right? Is this an eligible activity? Well, in this scenario, they're doing 2250 linear feet of sanitary sewer improvements, and it does meet an eligible activity. which is construction reconstruction. We have a document that is a citywide map, and we have LMI as the data to be able to understand that as well. So we're working our way down this checklist. But you'll notice that when we get to beneficiaries, we realize that the sewer improvements will only benefit a small set of beneficiaries and not the entire city, nor all of any block group. So surveys would be required to determine the actual beneficiaries receiving benefits from the improvements. And then we also have to look to see whether or not it was primary residential. In the event that we were able to say that the entire city would have been served, and let's see how we could have done that. We'll notice that we have main trunk lines going down the middle part of the city. And we'll also notice the location of the wastewater treatment plant. Had this city elected to do some maintenance or rehab on, um, on the actual water um, treatment plant itself, or maybe the main trunk line that leads the water to the wastewater treatment plant to be recycled, that is the sewer system. Therefore, of course, more justification would be needed in analysis, but this could have been a better alternative to maybe say that the entire area would have been served. But being that only a small portion of the project area within the city is being served is the requirement while they're going to be doing surveys to determine the actual beneficiaries and from them understanding the income and total number. Let's look at one more example. 
We have a subrecipient who's intending to create a detention pond that will help reduce flooding during heavy rain events by capturing storm water runoff from, the, from a few neighborhoods. So you'll notice the location of the detention pond. It's almost in what appears to be a vacant baseball park or some field. Uh, you'll also notice that there are there is a neighborhood directly left to that area and south to that area. And you'll notice to the far west of that area is there another neighborhood. If you look at the map of the census track uh, map, you'll notice that the local the location of the detention pond is within, we'll just call it block group number two. Although the neighborhood directly adjacent to it falls in block group three. So you'll also notice that large neighborhood all the way to the west also falls within block group three. So let's see what happens when we start looking. So the project falls within block group two, and the subrecipient wants to use only this block group to determine that the project meets an LMA national objective. The reason they say that is because this block group is primarily residential and it's over 51% of its residents are LMI. Although, because they were trying to say that the entire block group be served, we have to see, and it's on the boundary, let's see if in fact they are being served or if we have to look at other areas. Because there is a neighborhood to the west of block group two that would not benefit from the improvement, and that, that neighborhood is circled in one. We also see there is a neighborhood to the south in block group three that will receive benefit, and that's circled in two. It's a circle of that neighborhood. So not all of block group two will benefit, and only a portion of block group three will benefit. Therefore, the subrecipient, based on the this, this service and uh, anal area analysis, will be performing household surveys of the truly impacted neighborhoods to identify the true beneficiaries. And that's the number three right there, a circled area that actually would benefit through some type of hydrology, inundation study by the engineer of the true benefits of this project, therefore forcing to do surveys as it's not meeting the entire block group, and there are multiple areas within block groups being served. Okay. So next we're gonna talk about subrecipient capacity assessment. As Lauren mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, often infrastructure projects are carried out by local governments who serve as subrecipients to the state grantee. Since CDBGDR and CDBG MIP programs can be so complex, grantees and subrecipients should perform a capacity assessment of subrecipients prior to or as part of a contingency of award and committing of funding. Be sure to determine subrecipient's capacity to carry out its role in a compliant and timely manner. Well, how do you do that? Well, looking at grant management history could be a possibility. Maybe looking at past audits, for example, because that can reveal a lot. Also looking at staffing. Maybe having a conversation with a subrecipient and understanding their staffing experience and where they may be able to identify some gaps. We also look at program and activity experience financial management and reporting systems, and contractor oversight experience. Subrecipient capacity are often talked about from the perspective of being helpful to help grantees manage risks and identify areas of technical assistance they can, they, that they can, themselves can provide to subrecipients. However, since the grantees and subrecipients are partners and their success is intertwined, there are also great opportunities for subrecipients to understand where they need some additional support and either hire or procure, procure additional support to make sure they're set up for success in the design, delivery, and record keeping of their pro programs and projects. For more information on subrecipient management, be sure to check out the subrecipient webinar from earlier this month on the HUD Exchange. So, although CDBGDR and CDBG MED have their own suite of rules and regulations, waivers, alternative requirements, these funds also come with a large body of cross cutting and other applicable regulations. In your design of your project and selection of projects, it will be important to identify which rules and regulations, sorry about that, it'll be important to uh, decide which rules and regulations apply to your infrastructure project and whether or not they will direct, have a direct impact on managing your project. So we have a few areas we need to look at. You know, they have a timeline. So you'll notice that the cross-cutting regulations cover each portion of the areas of impact on this project. So as far as the timeline, you know, these cross-cutting regulations can add time and impact uh, the timing of whether certain steps in your project can happen. Failure to get this timing right could result in ineligible costs or unnecessary project delays. In respect to these requirements on budget, 
They all add additional oversight. So compliance can either alter the payment structure for projects. Some of these rules do this very directly. Some in the case of complying with federal labor standards in paying prevailing wages, which can be higher than the non-federal projects pay in that area, could be a budget uh, area to look at. On the other hand, while there aren't additional salary or payment requirements associated with complying with Section 3, it is important to include time for recruiting, reporting, and establishing a Section 3 coordination process to demonstrate how, to the greatest extent feasible, the subrecipient and or grantee have tried to meet the Section 3 goals of providing economic impact to Section 3 residences and businesses in that area. Similarly, the cost of monitoring in all these areas for each project can add staff hours to a subrecipient or grantee's budget, but failure to monitor and ensure projects are compliant can result in repayment of all portions of the project costs. You know, how does this relate to scope of work? You know, taking the time to plan how these requirements apply to the scope of work on the front end of the program design will help save grantees and subrecipients endless frustration on the back end. Having a comprehensive scope of work that identifies all applicable federal regulations not only helps map out how and when the requirements are going to be met, but also makes sure any potential construction contractors and bidders understand everything they're responsible for doing or complying with and if in, event, in the event they win the work. Record keeping and monitoring, these are really the areas that benefit from front end planning and incorporating all requirements into the project design and selection. Both requirements and grantees have the opportunity to either document or set up the file for documentation. And on the front end to this, you really wanna do that to minimize surprises and avoid ineligible costs or activities as the project gets approved and moves through the implementation stages. And then you have, lastly, you have closeout. In order to get a project to a closeout, the grantee and subrecipient will need to be able to document that all applicable requirements have been met. And you'll hear this often. It's always best to start with the end in mind and set the files up in a way that will be crystal clear down the road and allow for a smooth closeout whenever that time comes. So next, we're going to which is really going through um, procurement, environmental construction, um, actual mo monitoring, oversight, and obviously the closeout portion after. You also remember that monitoring and record, keep record keeping is a consistent uh, methodology throughout the uh, course of this life cycle. So let's set up some parameters which grantees and subrecipients have to work to meet the procurement requirements uh, when they're procuring goods and services when using CDBGDR and mitigation funding. So state grantees follow the existing procurement requirements of their state. They can adopt some, but not all procurement requirements in 2 CFR 200.318 through 326, combining state and federal regulations, or adopt 2 CFR 317 to apply all the procurement requirements in 2 CFR 318 through 326 to itself and to its subrecipients. Entitlement grantees and subrecipients follow to CFR 200.318 through 326. Part of the purpose of a competitive um, procurement process is to demonstrate transparency. There are many layers of procurement rules, federal, state, and sometimes local rules, and grantees must follow all of those applicable rules to their situation. In all cases, the stricter procurement regulations govern. HUD has a lot of great resources on the HUD exchange, one being the Buying Right Guide. Uh, and there's also a webinar, Buying Right to CDBGDR Procurement um, Requirements webinar, where you can learn more about procurement requirements and how they apply to grantees and subrecipients. So one of the, uh, when we're talking about staff capacity, subrecipient capacity, you know, looking through what that subrecipient or grantee can undertake is, is vital to understand really what procurements are necessary. You know, uh, a, a, a city or a county might have, you know, a permitting or a, a code enforcement office or um, some type of um, maybe a, a public works office that might have a staff engineer to help in the design process of a project. But, you know, if that's not the case, one of the earlier procurements a subrecipient might undertake on an infrastructure project is the procurement of an architect engineer uh, to help get the design moved forward and on to the approval of the project. So the subrecipient and the state grantee is following 2 CFR Part 200 
uh, can choose either the, the RFP, RFQ process for procuring engineers. Customarily, you know, the RFQ is the general uh, practice, but obviously other state and local regulations might be stricter, which allowing for that request for proposal. Uh, but when doing a request for proposal, you want to ask for qualifications and costs. When doing a request for qualifications, that's where you're asking for the experience and the expertise and does not rank and score based on cost. But the final cost and compensation is just If there are two rounds, you can clearly outline the application period, provide a clear scope of work, criteria methodology, and technical evaluation as well as the structure of the award and notification process so that all respondents are clear on how and when all associated processes will uh, coincide with the award selection process. The outcome here is the project is designed and detailed enough after you have your uh, engineer or your local um, engineer helping design that, your project designed and detailed enough to be able to move forward to an accurate environmental review and construction scope of work. Important, 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 document, document, document. Every component decision, scoring process, selection, notification process, um, and just make sure that your procurement is clearly and logically documented between within the file. If a subrecipient or grantee cannot demonstrate the procurement was compliant through documentation in the file, then the services may, be may not be eligible, uh, which could uh, result in recapture or denial of some cost. This is a prime example where front-end documentation can help avoid potential challenges down the road. So next, let's talk about environment. So as we know, CDG and CR mitigation uh, are going to be subject to NEPA and 24 CFR Part 58 requirements, uh, required for every dollar of CDBGDR and mitigation prior to uh, uh, obligating any funds. Uh, understanding the limitations on activities prior to the environmental clearance would be something to be considered. Uh, providing clear scope of work. Understanding the process, the correct level of environmental review, and required consultations in the estimated timeline is necessary, uh, which you're also able to, in some scenarios, are able to adopt another federal agency's environmental review, much like a FEMA NEPA review. Uh, so again, all CDBGDR uh, projects and mitigation projects must undergo an environmental review um, performed prior to the start of a project and before funds are expended on a project. This helps ensure that the proposed project does not negatively impact the surrounding environment and that the property site itself will not have an adverse in environmental or health effect on end users. Understanding environmental review and permitting requirements is a critical step in project planning as they impact the budget, timeline, and overall viability of the project as well as additional steps that may need to be taken in order to meet any conditions. The environmental review and clearance is a critical step in the project life cycle. If there is no environmental clearance by the responsible entity, then the project cannot be moved forward and in the event it's not signed and dated and documented, it might not be reimbursed. So, when you're looking at procuring construction contractors, this is the next phase, right? We got our, our capacity understanding. We're procuring either uh, an architect engineer to help that design scope. We're working on that environmental review. Um, we're getting to the point of, you know, once you get your authority to use grant funds, you can really start looking at procuring those construction uh, contracts. You know, but they must adhere to procurement requirements, and we'll go over a few of those key elements. So if obtaining an independent cost estimate before you go out for bid is vital so that you have a pre-procurement understanding of what is reasonable. Uh, like we said, you know, that local engineer or your procured engineer and architect might be able to help you develop that independent cost estimate if that was included in their scope of work when you procured their services. So next, you're going to want to solicit your bids, uh, your seal bids, your formal advertising, always ensuring that it's a firm fixed price lump sum or unit price contract. Also, making sure that you have a publication period in that seal bid solicitation. Um, published and solicited for potential bidders to be able to understand that reasonable time frame to respond to that solicitation. You also want to make sure that sol uh, solicited seal bid has a clear description, specifications, attachments, and scope of work, and also include Davis-Bacon and related acts requirements, including a current wage determination or decision. You want to make sure you're publicly opening those seal bids. at the time and place described based on criteria outlined in the solicitation and in accordance with your local 
uh, procurement policies and procedures, always ensuring you're awarding to the lowest responsible bidder. And then lastly, you're going to execute that contract. So when preparing a contract, it's important to include all the requirements that were included in the procurement documents and any additional parameters that will help the subrecipient or grantee manage their contracts. Importantly, all the applicable cross-cutting requirements, such as the wage rate, wage determination, and Section 3 language must be included in their contract. This, along with uh, ongoing and additional te technical assistance and guidance, helps the contractors and the subrecipient ensure everyone is on the same page and they understand their compliance requirements. Now that we have our construction contractor underway, we can move on to permitting. So permits, written authorizations issued by city, county, state, and or federal agencies construct a pro uh, to construct a project to ensure the safety and the work is compliant with building construction zoning codes and environmental codes and rules. Permits are issued after the plans and specifications of a project are drafted by the architect and engineer. Some of the larger regional projects will likely require close coordination with multiple jurisdictions and could also require permitting from the Army Corps of Engineers. But again, building and permitting into the front end timeline and budget is important to help manage expectations and set the project set schedule and get those processes moving as early and as feasible as possible. Also holding pre-construction conferences. You know, before starting any work, it's a best practice and sometimes required depending on the grantee or subrecipient's procedures, to hold a pre-construction conference. So this conference is an opportunity to provide an overview of the general plan of construction operations and other contractual requirements. So during this meeting, all applicable labor laws, Section 3, worker protection, and other contractual compliance requirements are covered, such as communication and reporting protocols, payment and progress inspection schedules, the steps for processing and conditions of approvals for change orders, if those come about, and all record keeping requirements. Lastly, you'd want to give your notice to proceed. The notice to proceed is a clean way for a grantee or the subrecipient to formally notify that contractor that they can start work. By including this step in the process, it allows the grantee and subrecipient to confirm their files are in order, that all the pieces and permits are in place, and all other conditions are being met before starting work. Moving on to construction management. You know, we've gotten our staff capacity, our procured services, we got our environmental, we got our construction contractor on hand, we got our notice to proceed out. So now we're moving on to construction management. Whichever entity is responsible for the implementation of the project, whether that's the grantee or the subrecipient, that entity is responsible for managing their construction contractors and their vendors. At this point, they have ideally invested a lot of time in preparing the contractor and have set the project up in a way that they know all the compliance requirements that need to be tracked so that once the construction is underway, there is a clear and smooth contractor management experience. Part of this smooth experience comes from front-end investment, but it also comes from regular progress, progress inspections, communication, and verification of information that the contractor submits in their reports. You know, some of the most important compliance requirements must be documented and verified often throughout the construction process. The project progresses in an efficient and effective way, and this includes financial oversight and inspection of work. All contractor costs, like all project program costs, must be allowable, you know, and eligible costs, it must be reasonable, right, consistent with pre-award cost reasonable determinations. They must be allocable, you know, able to legitimately be charged to the grant and documented, such as like timesheets. So, you know, the only way to verify this is to have regular inspections and to verify the work is being performed per the requirements and per the invoices that are being submitted. One key, key compliance aspect that takes place during um, management of construction is Davis-Bacon compliance. Requirements to meet Davis-Bacon include contractors and subcontractors submitting weekly certified payrolls to the subrecipient's labor compliance officer, also sometimes called LCO. So this LCO is going to be reviewing payrolls and also conducting on-site interviews of workers. Additionally, job site notices must be posted on-site and wage reports reviewed and filed. Often on infrastructure program projects, there are additional environmental conditions that have to be, have been met in order to receive environmental clearance. 
So ensuring those conditions have been met during construction is also important and also must be documented. So ideally in a perfect world, change orders don't, don't happen, but it is sometimes a reality. So changes are unforeseen, circumstances occur, and it's important to lay the conditions for change orders out clearly in the contract and during the pre-construction conference. So the contractor knows what needs to happen in order to change the cost modification. The contractor should update the schedule frequently, and the grantee should check in inspector to forecast expenditure of funds, you know, making sure that your project schedule is going to marry up with how you envision the expenditure and, and, and actual reimbursement of funds. And then lastly, you know, we have record keeping. Uh, the files have to tell the story and how, the, how you built the project complies with all applicable regulations and adequate records and documentations are kept. So you know, tell the story, you know, in order to do that, you have to document so that when you are ready to report back to HUD on a closeout report, you have everything within one um, basic way, uh, more, you know, formatted way and housed in one place. The next we have project completion. So typical project completion steps are subject to, but you know, not limited to, you know, normally you're gonna get a certificate of occupancy on some type of housing activity or other verification of completion through some third party final inspection. Uh, it's also applicable to any operational permits being obtained uh, photos of the final project, environmental conditions being met, labor in Section 3 requirements met, final payment, payment including that retainage, if held, um, re release of liens, uh, review of final file to ensure all documentation is included. So the, doc the project is now complete. Moving on to project closeout. So at this point, you probably had the ribbon cutting project has either helped a community recover or is protecting them from a future disaster, and everyone is happy to move on. So, but now is not the time to try to build your closeout file from scratch. Luckily, you've been documenting, documenting, documenting the project file from beginning, and the closeout should be a brief. However, there are some major areas that you'll want to make sure are resolved and cleared in your closeout file. Remember, no one may look at this file again for years down the road. So make sure it's clear enough for a stranger to the project to pick up and fully understand. And you know, how do you do that? Documenting, demonstrating all eligible activities are completed and the project meets a national objective would be one, one way. Also, project file is fully documented, documented, documented. Budget amendment or reconciliations are completed as applicable. All reporting requirements in the DRGR have been completed. Any special conditions have been met. Monitoring findings closed and audit findings closed. And so that's the way you want to document your files for project closeout. And with that, I think we'll turn to some questions that may have came in um, during the presentation. So I'll hand it back over to you, Olivia. Um, okay, so for this part of the webinar, we're going to transition into the Q&A um, session. And so, Kelly, I will give that to you. All right, thank you. I'm Kelly Price with ICF, and I've um, uh, just been watching the um, questions come in um, from the session, and we, we don't have a whole lot of um, questions. Um, one was around, um, you know, sort of, since we have talked a good bit about CUBG MIT funding and CUBG DR and some uh, unique facets of CUBG MIT, um, we had a question regarding um, those MIT funds and, and um, how those how those are allocated and can be used. So um, I think I think we're fairly clear on that. Um, one question that we just received, I was just trying to um, chat back and forth with our HUD folks on. Um, is um, concerning if a grantee has costs prior to, uh, I, I assume what they mean here is sort of executing their grant agreement to do some of the technical analysis or financial analysis that would be appropriate to um, to uh, look into a potential project, um, how could they pay for that? Um, and 
my thought was to direct them to the you know pre award cost guidance, which is in the regulations and any specifics around that in the Federal Register notice applicable to that particular disaster. Um, but HUD folks, do you have any um, any other um, direction or guidance on that? Certainly there's some limitations around that. <laughs> yeah, this is Clay. Um, so I, I just want to second everything you said and then uh, just add that uh, if the question is if there's uh, pre award funds. We do not have pre award funds, but however, like uh, I just mentioned, um, pre award costs, once you get your grant agreement, are potentially eligible for reimbursement. So uh, they just need to make sure you need to make sure that they're eligible costs, uh, they're for an eligible activity, and um, that you um, are making sure that they're undertaken. Uh, in accordance with the environmental review requirements at 24 CFR Part 58. Um, so yes, we do uh, allow for reimbursement of pre-award costs, but we don't uh, front-end pre-award funds. Right. So you have to read do the reimbursement, and also keep in mind that if you're you are going to be able to meet all those requirements um, to reimburse with the CBDR MET funds. When you receive those, that um, Clay mentioned a really big requirement. All the others would apply as well to CFR 200, procurement, financial management, all the other stuff. But environmental review is going to be one of the big ones um, that would need to be met because you're required to look at your project comprehensively um, as you um, as you complete that environmental review. So you'd want to get out of the gate early. Now, the environment, the cost of the environmental review itself, you know, Clay, as you probably have seen could be eligible also as a pre-award cost, but um, you're gonna have a limitation on how much of that that you can, that you can do. Um, we have another question that's, um, you know, more money related, I guess, that just came in. I think this is a great question, where we have an example of a county um, that is contracting with a city within that county to construct a new sewer line, but that could be any type of infrastructure. Um, once a contract is awarded, can the county pay the city for the work that's being done, or is it better to pay the contractor directly? Is there a preference? So this is really more of an issue of, um, you know, best practices, if you will. Um, one of my first responses would be um, you want to sort of follow the, the legal documents in place, and by that I mean um, you know, who conducted the procurement, who has the contract with the contractor, in my opinion, should should be the entity paying the contractor. Um, we don't have enough information here to really know that for sure, but Clay, again, I know you've implemented these projects in the field as well as Robbie and Lauren, so do you have any um, sort of best practice guidance when you have multiple parties involved, multiple local governments involved, and um, how best to sort of have that trail of payments and documentation around those costs? Sure. So uh, another thing just to think about is um, making sure you have your contracts between these entities in place, whether that's a memorandum of understanding, a memorandum of agreement, or a subrecipient agreement. So kind of speaking to what you were saying about uh, understanding the relationship more, uh, you need to make sure that you have um, a contract in place that's, that's um, clearly delineating who is taking on the project delivery or program implementation and administration activities. Um, and if you are passing them through, um, just know that you don't pass through everything. So if you're the uh, grantee of the CDBG MIT funds or CDBGDR funds, uh, you're still, still your responsibility to report to HUD on progress and to monitor your subrecipients and partner agencies. Um, so you can partner with another entity to um, pass on some of the project delivery, administration, and implementation uh, work, but uh, you still need to monitor them. And then, again, we would need to hear more information about that situation, um, but uh, definitely these types of partnerships have happened in the past. Great. 
Thank you. Um, another great question, um, Robbie, because you mentioned um, labor standards. Of course, another one of the, I, I, I think the three big ones, as I call it, when it applies to all projects, but particularly infrastructure is going to be, of course, your procurement, right? And the environmental requirements and then um, Davis-Bacon uh, labor standards are going to apply pretty much across the board on those type of projects. So we had a great question about where to find, um, whether or not there is and where to find uh, helpful information to provide to subrecipients and other parties about Davis-Bacon requirements and, and information on how they comply with that. And so I'm going to chat back to, um, or excuse me, answer back in the Q&A box um, the link to HUD.gov's Office of Labor Relations information. Um, that is not located on the HUD Exchange. Office of Labor Relations um, guidance is all still on the HUD.gov website. But there's um, several, several tools there. There's the language that needs to be in all of your uh, procurement documents, your bid packages, um, your contract documents and um, any subcontracts with subcontractors. So there's some standard contractual language that covers all the Davis-Bacon and related acts. Um, so that's number one. Um, the number two critical thing for Davis-Bacon is making sure that the applicable and current wage decision or wage determination is included in the, um, again, in the bid package and the contract documents and passed on also to subcontractors. So that's really important. So that sort of covers you from the perspective of the legal requirements and making sure those are in the documents and conveyed down the, the trail of subcontractors. In terms of helpful documents, um, Davis-Bacon, uh, the, excuse me, HUD's Office of Labor Relations has a couple of, of um, little guidebooks that can be um, downloaded and they're in English and Spanish pertaining to, for contractors and one uh, for grantees that are nice summaries, very to sort of summarize all the requirements and sort of what implementation is required during the course of a project. They also have a number of the uh, required posters that need to be posted on the project site. Um, there's a number of those, including the wage determination that must be visually present on project site. And so those are provided and they're downloadable in the PDF format and also um, currently also available in Spanish. Um, also, the um, uh, other place I refer folks to is the, um, the uh, Department of Labor website, the U.S. Department of Labor website. You can find their um, very detailed handbook on labor, Davis-Bacon implementation and other labor laws. And that's where you can also find the most updated information regarding the um, payroll forms and the statements of compliance that are required throughout the duration of the project to document that the contractor and the subcontractors are in fact meeting all those requirements. So um, pretty much you can create almost a library of all the different regulatory and implementation and compliance tools that you need from both the HUD.gov website as well as um, the Federal Department of Labor website um, where Davis-Bacon and those related acts are discussed. So we'll try to provide um, those links uh, to you, but. Um, hopefully that's helpful to folks who maybe haven't dealt with labor before um, because they haven't maybe done those larger infrastructure projects. Um, let's see, what else do we have, Clay? Hi, um, Kelly, do you mind if I add just one thing? Oh, no, please go ahead. Yeah, so the uh, one other thing I just want to add, because this is infrastructure, uh, you know, there's oftentimes work that's been done in the past. Um, and on a project and, you know, from other funding sources and you're starting to build out your scope of work and you're trying to, um, you know, do a project with that is uh, part of that or an expansion of that, um, just realize we have recent Dave uh, uh webinar that we sent out um, to grantees uh, and grant managers in, the, in their uh, the various regions uh, that says that we have a letter from the Department of Labor saying we can uh, kind of classify Davis Bacon requirements. Uh, we can uh, apply them prospectively from the date of the grant agreement. So just know that, uh, you know, you're, everything that I mentioned is uh, still in effect, but we're kind of got an alternative interpretation where the Davis Bacon requirements apply prospectively, which means going forward. 
um, in work after the data grant agreement. And if you have any questions about, about that, you can reach out to the uh, policy unit at the RSI or your uh, grant manager, your HUD grant manager. That's great. Thank you. A couple others we'll throw at uh, you guys. Uh, one, someone asked, um, and, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'll throw it to you guys. The um, there's Is there a, a Buy American requirement such as was in place during um, some of the recession funding, uh, the ARA funding and whatnot, is there a Buy American requirement for CBGDR or CBGG MIT? And I'm not aware of one, Clay, but if, if there's anything else. Oh, yeah, no, uh, no, no, <laughs> it's my understanding as well that there's not a Buy American for CBGDR. Okay. All right, great. Um, I've got uh, I've got one that's a little more complex that I don't know that we want to regarding environmental assessment and um, recertifying that. Um, the, the particular question has to deal with uh, the timing, I guess, of when the EA was done relatively to a con, con plan cycle. And first and foremost, you should talk to your environmental rep in your uh, field office or. Um, talk to your DR rep and, and have them connect you with an environmental rep for your, your DR grant. But generally, environmental assessments are not tied to a comm plan cycle. They are done separately um, in a way that is consistent with what that project involves um, and how long that project is, you know, is going to take and um, what the impact of that project is on the environment. So I uh, just want to uh, you may want to further, again, feel that apart with your environmental review rep, but on the surface, environmental reviews and comp plan cycles are separate and apart from each other. And they, an environmental review should not have a, a time constraint around it because of a comp plan. You're supposed to be looking at the environmental considerations and all the requirements in 24 CFR Part 58 and NEPA to do your environmental review. Um, you also technically don't recertify environmental reviews. Um, there's there's some language in 24 CFR Part 58 about changing conditions and things like that. So I'd direct you to, to take a look at that and again talk to your HUD rep. Any other guidance, um, Clay, on that? Uh, no, just saying that uh, you know contact your HUD and grant manager. Yeah. Your Federal Register notice should have some uh, additional explanation, but it's very complex. Yeah, each one of those is very different. A um, uh, question about CBG MIT and um, a period of performance limitation, i.e., uh, should projects be completed within a certain amount of time? <laughs> I'm going to hand that one to you for sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you repeat that question one more time? Yeah, question about uh, period of performance implementation, but then they go on to say, i.e., a project must be completed within X number of months. What what are the time constraints around the CBG MIT projects? And funding, more, more so, I should say. So is this a question about uh, funding uh, timelines or project performance timelines? Uh, that's, that's good. I don't have enough information to know. Uh, I think uh, Jen, Jen uh, at HUD will be able to answer this one. Okay. <laughs> Hi, guys. Sorry. Um, yeah, so mitigation has, because of the unique nature of the funds that I think Lauren mentioned when she was talking about it, we have given grantees um, additional flexibilities mm -hmm. on at least the expenditure of funds. Um, so. The expenditure deadlines on the funds are six years for 50% of the funds and then 12 years for 100% of the funds. So that's quite a bit. That's, you know, nearly double that what we usually give for DR. Um, we don't have rules around when projects have to be completed. Um, our rules are really about spending the funds and grantees will usually find themselves um, having spent the funds and then having some lag time to really like close out projects, close out the grant. Um, and so projects can um, potentially continue. Um, you just need to sort of plan for that when you're looking at your programs, obviously, because um, you want to have some money to um, be able to keep keep going with the, the procedures and the planning and the record keeping that, that needs to happen 
um, for your closeout activities. So it's just something to think about. But we usually, our, our deadlines with our funds and both the DR and the MIT funds are usually around expenditure um, deadlines, if that's helpful and if that answers their question. If it doesn't answer it, maybe they can chime back into the Q&A box. Sounds great, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other um, any other questions that we haven't either already chatted back on or answered. Um, and I'm, we're looking at, I think we're right at time here. Um, uh, Clay, any parting words um, or Jen from HUD um, on infrastructure or from Lauren or Robbie? Yeah, just uh, just that we uh, have, this is one part in many parts of our uh, summer webinar series. So if you have, are you interested in these topics around infrastructure, but also other topics around CDBG MIT and CDBG DR, uh, go to our website at HUD Exchange um, and uh, go into the training section and you'll find uh, all our previous webinars on there as well. And if you're not already, please make sure you're signed up for the HUD Exchange listserv so that you receive those notices going forward, as well as all the other great information that comes out when there's new guidance or we post materials or a clinic or um, new, new uh, Federal Register notices or anything else like that. So um, thank you, Lauren and Robbie and Clay, um, for your presentation and all the hard work that went into that today. I think it was a great topic. And with that, we'll close close another one out. Uh, thank you to the participants. Again, we'll be um, posting materials within about two weeks or so, so you'll have the slides, uh, a webinar transcript, as well as the recording to refer to on the CBGDR website. Thank you all. Thank you.